Hello, Tess. Um, so yeah, this is the uh, build process panel, which you know thematically is all about how do we take our source code in whatever form it may be and transpile, preprocess, minify, optimize, etc., until it arrives in its final form. Um, so um, my name is Ben Vinegar. Um, I'm a lead front engineer at Discuss. Uh, I also wrote a book called Third Party JavaScript. It's pretty terrible. Uh, I'm, I have five wonderful uh, panelists with me. Uh, first, there's Kyle Simpson, um, who you may know is the author of LabJS. He's also an author. He's writing a book called You Don't Know JS. Um, Nick Fisher, uh, who works at SoundCloud, and he designs and implements a lot of their build systems, SoundCloud being a rel relatively large client-side application with some cool stuff going on. Um, Adi Asmani, who um, develops uh, to-do MVC and uh, Yeoman, which is a scaffolding tool, um, working with Grunt. And he also works on Chrome Dev Tools. And then uh, Sebastian Golash, who works for Deutsche Telekom. I practiced pronouncing that for a, a while. Um, working on a, um, a product there that also uses sort of like older traditional build tools, like um, I don't know if older is the right word, but with Maven combined with Grunt and uh, some client side stuff. And then uh, lastly, 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 I have uh, Gareth Rushgrove, who works for the UK government, working on a big project that involves modernizing a whole bunch of uh, UK government websites and bring them into the modern era. Um, and with that said, Gareth is just going to start us off with a quick presentation. Slides up. Do I have to do anything? <laughs> hey. Ooh. Hey. Uh, OK, your build process needs you, because uh, it's probably not as good as it could be. Um, maybe it is. Um, but what is a build process? I think and what we're talking about really is it has, it's a way of sharing common actions as much as anything else. Um, if it's just you doing something, well, and you're just doing it once, that's not really a build process. But actually storing it as a, something that you can come back to, or more commonly storing it as something that your team can come back to is really important. Um, because frankly, people suck at repetitive tasks. Um, if I ask someone to do something um, over and over again, they'll probably do it subtly different. Um, a build process is always about standardizing those repetitive tasks. Um, and some of that's to do with the fact that words can mean different things to different people. If I say, oh, can you minimize this bit of JavaScript for me? People will do it differently. And that's probably no good in an environment where you're trying to work together. You end up with different results. Um, someone might take longer. That's no good. We need to standardize. Um, but your build process is software. Um, and certainly for some people, the people come to sort of certainly front end engineering, front end um, sort of web development from lots of different paths. And not all of them will think of themselves as software developers. Uh, tough. You're a software developer. If you're anywhere near a build process, you're a software developer. Live with it. Um, but what are we building? What are the sorts of types of things that we're putting into our build process? Um, and Ben mentioned a few things um, that will be common to lo lots of people in the room, sort of CSS uh, pre-processing, templating, Kyle. Um, uh, bundling, minification, linting, uh, testing, optimization, transpiling. There's lots of things we're doing with our code. Um, and there's lots of tools we're using. I mean, two of the sort of like, common ones at the moment, um, certainly in the sort of front end space, appear to be sort of like Gulp and Grunt. Um, Grunt, this was a few days ago, but I bet it's about the same today. Maybe it's, maybe it's less today, because we're all in this room. Um, <laughs> uh, or watching on the video. Uh, the, like, 30,000 installs of this every day, that sounds quite a lot. That's a lot of interest. That's a lot of people. Um, there's 2,500 like, Grunt plugins, and I'll come back to why that might not be great in a moment. Um, there's actually 450 Gulp plugins, and that's a tool that's not been around anywhere near as long. Um, but I said I'll come back to why that might not be good in a moment. Is <laughs> ContribJSN is a Grunt plugin. And there's, excellent, there's one for Gulp, brilliant. Um, and there's Grunt Coffee and Gulp Coffee. And there's Broccoli Coffee as well. <laughs> and at some point, and there definitely will be someone in this room, someone watching this, who's building, oh no, I'm building another one. And hoping someone comes along and builds another one dash coffee and JSHint and everything else. And we know there's two and a half thousand 
grunt plugins. Do we want two and a half thousand gulp ones and broccoli ones and everything else? Um, and it's not just about the sort of, I, I think there's probably a lot of front end people in the, the room. There's probably not like people writing JavaScript, writing CSS, writing HTML sort of most of their time. Um, is that fair to say? Any, any person going like, I'm basically just a Java programmer? That's all happy with that. Um, but we're all working in environments where there probably is a backend and that might not be written in JavaScript. You, maybe you're using Node, maybe you're not. Maybe it's Ruby, maybe it's Python, maybe it's C Sharp. It doesn't <coughs> matter. There's a lot of other things going on around you that also have build processes. Um, and there's loads of build tools, um, whether it's Make or Make, Maven, NAN, SPD, there's loads of these. There's a bit at the bottom that says two points for each tool, minus five if you liked using Maven. Um, <laughs> uh, ultimately, building software isn't new. Um, it's happening all over the place. and having standardizing on things, standardizing things in silos probably isn't enough. Um, even when it comes to sort of typical tasks around front-end engineering, um, a lot of those have, have been, have plugins or projects related to other build tools that are doing it. Um, whether that's sort of uh, multiple versions of things like Django uh, static compiler or compressor versus sprockets in Rails versus uh, static in PHP. Like there's this, this is spiraling mass of all these things doing this fundamentally the same jobs. Um, and really, sort of everything in old is new again. Building software is not new. It's maybe new to, uh, these tools are new, Grunt and Gulp. Like, there's a lot of interest around sort of programming in JavaScript at the moment. There's a lot of new tools coming around, but this isn't <coughs> fundamentally a new activity. And some of the same mistakes have been made. Some of the learnings are not being taken forward. Um, Make is older than you, probably. I wrote this before turning up. I still think that's broadly true. Um, unless you're 37, Make is older than you. Um, there's a few people here who probably look older than 37, but I reckon <laughs> most of you, I'm, I'm going to go for Make is older than you. Make is a build tool. Um, if you haven't seen it, it looks like this. If you're thinking, wait a minute, where's all the rest of the code? Um, uh, you can think, well, maybe you should be using Make rather than Grunt. Um, <laughs> Uh, and do you know how many make plugins there are? Um, I don't think there are any. That's probably going to be completely untrue. But basically, there aren't really make plugins. There aren't really plugins for uh, ls as a Unix command tool. Um, the reason is because Unix pipes are amazing. Or are the concept of simply chaining things together by sending information between them. Um, so grep is, like, ls doesn't have a grep plugin or a sort plugin. Um, and it, it's just about Unix command line tools being able to be chained together. Um, it doesn't matter that these things could be written in different languages um, by different people at different times. We don't have to customize them all via plugin models. Um, and I think sort of, actually, I, I don't do a lot of front-end stuff. I haven't done for quite a while. So actually, I did a whole bunch of research and, and into sort of like what people were doing to be on this panel. And I thought, as a community, it seems that there's a lot of effort reinventing the wheel. And this isn't just true for this community. That's true of basically programmers, um, myself included. Um, but we invent, invariably invent things like, and reinvent things in our language of choice and sometimes in our tool of choice. But the thing we often miss is it's, that's our language and tool of choice at the moment, and that probably changes over time. Um, and so anything that we can do to minimize that is probably a good thing to think about. Um, because we can make things better, um, and ultimately, like things are better now than they were before. They're, they're like having tools is good. This is not about sort of like, oh, we shouldn't have done any of that. Like throw it all away. It's about how can we make it a lot more sustainable. How can we learn from maybe like twenty odd years, thirty odd years of other programming communities build processes. Um, so, what is the most valuable unit of sharing? Is it a plugin? Um, how can we build community consensus and like, avoid the plugin apocalypse? I like that. I, I think there's a genuine problem there. Um, can we share entire pipelines as well as tools? And it's fine sharing the individual bits, but actually, we probably then all take a collection of things together um, and string it together to do the same thing. And actually, can we share the pipeline? And is that a better unit of sharing? Um, 
And importantly, how do we break down sort of some of these like these artificial programming language si silos? Because even if you're thinking, well, actually, my career is going to be all about front end engineering. It's all going to be about JavaScript and CSS and HTML. And they're probably that's probably go they're going to change. They're going to evolve. They're going to get better. The tools around it's going to get better. But that's what I'm going to do. You probably do it in a context where other people around you are writing different programming languages. And how do we mean make it so? There's not that culture class. There's not that us versus them. How do we bring these things together? Um, they're just some of the things that were in my head and some of the things that I sort of care about. Um, the, the, pan my, the panelists might violently disagree with some of that. So with that, we can go on to the panel. Uh, so thanks, Gareth. I think that was a pretty good, pretty good way to start us off. Um, there's a question I'm looking for. Oh, God. As I kind of browse this thing that's been moved around. Oh, boy. Um, I'm going to ask on um, Cornell Lis Lisinski. Um, and also, I just want to say, I feel that we butchered your question slightly. <laughs> and if you, would like to, if you would like to go, you know, go original with this, yeah. please do so. Uh, is eliminating a need for a build process a goal of web standards? For example, should CSS uh, adopt all the features of CSS preprocessors, or should it avoid duplicating them? So one of the uh, the really nice things about the ex uh, the extensible uh, web manifesto has been, you know, the community starts to iterate on features in languages like JavaScript and, and, and tools like JavaScript and, and so on. Um, and once we reach a, a nice consensus there, we can then go and move on to standardizing um, those features. So in the case of CSS and, and preprocessors, um, we've already started to see things like variables actually land and, and go from things like SAS and, and less um, directly into CSS. The same thing is being done with, with mix-ins. Um, I think that um, it's perhaps not necessarily the browser's responsibility to uh, provide hooks into your, your build process, like a pre-process step or a post-process step. That seems to be something that would be um, better left up to additional tools or something on the server side. Um, but I think that we currently have a good system in place for actually landing things that, uh, that the community is doing and, and finding useful like patterns um, directly inside uh, native primitives. Um, and I'd like to see us continue doing that. So I want to jump in. Because um, they asked me to be on the panel so that I could disagree with everyone. So, um, <laughs> uh, so I actually think it's a terrible idea to standardize all of these things into CSS and into HTML and JavaScript. Um, for example, I think it would be an awful world if the browser had a, a transpiler for every one of the thousand languages that are out there. There are things that belong in our tool sets. There are things that belong in our technology. And there are things that belong in a build process. And I draw a very distinct line between them. So transpiling, a lot of things that we see in CS preprocessors are things that I think aren't necessarily great to be in the CSS language. They're things that tools could do for you. So I don't think it's a good idea at all to go down that sort of slippery slope of saying anything that I can dream up should just drop into a standard. I think build processes are there for a reason. And I don't see them going away any day. If yeah. anyone's got a way of just dreaming stuff up and dropping it into a standards process, though, I'd like to hear about that it. That would be awesome. <laughs> um, uh, I think fundamentally, the, like, the friction around standardizing things is it takes time and it's hard for good reason. So actually, I think the answer is yes. But realistically, the rate that that happens is slow for good reasons. Until we can broadly all agree on something, then it's not going to get standardized. And we're definitely not going to broadly agree on everything at any time soon. Um, so therefore, it's the stuff that we can fight about that goes in our different build processes. I'd, I'd kind of agree with Kyle here as well that um, I think one of the real benefits um, and the reason that uh, JavaScript and CSS got to where it is now is because it didn't do that ever. Like, it is uh, a very bare bones uh, language in JavaScript um, that has let all of us then come up with these new tools and these new things to build upon a, a very basic level. And I think that if we... Um, if we decide to do that, say, 10 years ago, we might have a very different language today. So I just to sort of like tack onto this, which is that, you know, historically, have we even done a good job of, you know, when we take, um, you know, features from other languages and, and bring them into JavaScript or CSS, like, um, is, is people talk to me a lot about um, we shouldn't even be using jQuery, but we should be doing straight DOM. But I find that those, you know, those API methods are still pretty like verbose, and they're not very, 
you know, fun to use. So if we went along the path of you know, bringing a lot of these, you know, let's say l less and SAS features into CSS, like, would we even get it right? Would it, would it be like fun to work with? I, I think that I is think it's a, I think it's okay for these tools to inform standards, but I, I think we should draw a line and say, not just because somebody can put something into a build process doesn't mean that it will ever belong in a standard. So there's plenty of good examples, for better or worse, that CoffeeScript informed ES6, and I think those, you know, I don't like all of them, but there's there's that's good that we were able to inform that. But I don't think that it would be a good idea for CoffeeScript to natively start being in the browser. I think that's a build step. So I think the, the TLDR of that is um, it, it looks like it's probably not the best idea for everything that's is possible inside a build process today to be baked into the browser. We're always going to fundamentally differ um, when it comes to our tools. Um, and there, there are going to be some patterns that, that it makes sense to eventually land. Um, natively, but on the whole, if, if we can do something outside of that process, let's let's keep rolling with that. And also, the, in my opinion, the, the good part of using a tool in a build process, using processing before it, it is in a browser, is like you, if it doesn't make sense, you can throw it away. If it's once it's been in the browser, it's there forever, period. And that's a huge problem. That's also why standards are like slow in the common sense. But it's the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, there was also a second. So there was a second part to Cornell's question, the original question. I don't know that you touched on it exa exactly. <laughs> I was hoping that he would. Um, but it was about should the idea of preprocessing itself be a standards feature? Like if we are basically in agreement that it seems like most of our code is being <coughs> taken from one source into another, is there an idea of like having a um, you know a preprocess step versus a run runtime step? Looking for a nod from you. Does it seem? I mean, have I captured that? So, um, by that I was thinking. Uh, by that I was thinking whether CSS should be optimized for being preprocessed, whether it should have uh, syntax or features that are not for humans to type manually, but for preprocessors to generate, for example, like the dollar sign in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any comments on that? Uh, well, I'll jump in since I happen to be experimenting with what I call CSS templating as opposed to CSS preprocessing. And um, I think that's a better way to go. So again, what I said was there's several things that we've been informed by Less and SAS that do belong in the CSS language. And I, I'm glad that we've got tools that have sort of standardized on what those things are, like, for instance, being able to drop in a value or, for instance, being able to nest a rule or something like that. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I think should be externalized. So I think we can draw those distinct lines. And um, I think the tools can standardize on the stuff that is smart. But that's obviously a gray area. I mean, it's hard for any one person to say, here's where the line goes. So the community, I think, needs to be more responsible about um, not just looking at the new shiny thing that somebody dreamed up, but saying, well, re really, should that actually be adopted or should that stay in sort of the user lane? I think we need, as a community, to be more responsible with that decision. OK. Uh, on that note, I'm going to bring us to our next question. Um, I'm going to call on from the audience Ernesto um, Jimenez. So the question is, much of the new tools and build processes are growing within the Node.js community and depend on the Node stack and NPM. Do you think this dependency might be limiting in the future? So let's, let's talk about Node for a moment. So Node has been um, growing in popularity quite extensively over the last couple of years. Um, it currently has something like 35,000 downloads um, a day. I think 0 0.1 was downloaded something like a million times. Um, and so Node's popularity is increasing, which is great. At the same time, you have to remember that um, the long tail, so not, not necessarily the people in this room, but people who are still afraid of the command line, people who want to be able to optimize their pages and their apps and so forth, but don't necessarily um, feel like it's, it's a, a nice place to go into the command line. They still feel it's like really, really scary. It's those people that we actually need to come up with solutions for. Um, and uh, there do exist tools that can help with this stuff. Um, you know, the, the long tail generally like working with, uh, with GUIs. And we can, you know, we, can, we can tie that stuff back to Node, whether we're using something like Node WebKit or, or additional tooling, so that they just have to say, well, here is, here's, here's my project, or here are the directories I'm working with. Um, can you just bind these to the different tools that might you know, do pre-processing, post-processing, and so forth? So I don't think, 
I don't think that um, using Node is something that's, that's stopping us. Um, it's just going to be about sort of improving um, awareness of, of how OK it is to, to use things like Node um, and the command line when you're actually working. Like, yeah. I think coming out of that from a like, completely different point as well is sort of Node's a runtime. And yeah, you, like whether someone's using a command line or another tool, it's just it's something that's actually occurred. For some environments, that is a barrier to entry. They're not going to put Node on their environment. That's fine. That's going to that's going to happen. One thing that is happening though, because I think there's there's been a lot of interest in the tools that have been built on top of it, <coughs> is people and there's certainly some work around uh, basically embedding a, a like a node, uh, basically a node runtime in the JVM and for for environments which are same same saying like we're not going to install this random new tool, but we are happy with running all this Java stuff. So I think <coughs> I think that becomes a less limiting factor over time. The tools will be able to be run in different places. So to yeah. build off of that, I think what it gets to is I would wholeheartedly say we should standardize on JavaScript <coughs> for driving these tools. But Node is the tool right now. It won't be the tool necessarily five years <coughs> from now or ten years from now because Node wasn't the first server-side JavaScript engine and it's certainly not the last. We had one from Netscape in the very early days of JavaScript. It didn't survive. Rhino and now Nash Warren. I mean, we've got a whole bunch of other environments. So I think to the, uh, to the extent that it's possible for a tool author to build a developer tool, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, not a developer tool, a build process tool in JavaScript and try to be as agnostic as possible, try to put as, as few touch points to the specific host environment as possible, then we see that five years from now when there's something that supersedes Node, it won't be as hard to convert that tool over. Most of the, the logic will survive. So I think we should be doing that. So, so oh, go ahead. So um, if we think like five years ago, we didn't have Node. And um, back then, we did like build scripts with Ant, this XML Java thingy, and maybe put a Rhino jar in there because we only knew JavaScript. And so we could script something up that does a little bit on top of it. It was hard to configure. Mm -hmm. And so with the rise of Node, front-end developers who are, were capable of writing JavaScript and couldn't write some other languages or only CSS and HTML besides. Or didn't want to. Or didn't want to. <laughs> uh, well, just had the power to, to tap into that build process without just learning another language or um, whatever, or another tool. And <coughs> so they're now familiar with the stack and they can embrace like, this whole plugin ecosystem or whatever. And I think that that's a so really good thing. I, I want to cut you guys off and actually just bring up the second part of that question, which we haven't touched on at all, which was um, NPM. Um, so uh, you know, I think everyone seems to be pretty positive on Node, but what about this idea that there's a huge dependence on NPM as a as a package manager manager and then the the NPM repository, for which I think it's fair to say there's been you know some you know bumpiness too. <laughs> um, what are you talking about? I, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Um, well, bumpiness. <laughs> just in, in case to contextualize this, like for example, I think a month ago uh, they changed the way that they changed their certificates, their security certificates, without notice. And then I think a lot of people who had depended on on Node, it is, they just couldn't download packages for a day, and there was no instructions, there was no no not, you know no communication about what had happened. Just as an example point, it's not the the only one. Would anyone want to touch up on this? Perhaps I'm going to start with you. <coughs> I think like that's going to be a problem if you're relying on any third party to host your, um, the things that you need for your application. Um, I don't think it's unique to NPM. Uh, I think NPM is solving a, a really good problem right now. Um, but if something were to replace that in the future, then <coughs> I think that it shouldn't be that difficult to actually transition across to that or even get rid of that altogether, like flatten all your dependencies, check that in if, if it came to that. I'm not suggesting you do that, but um, I don't see that NPM itself is, is an issue there. Well, NPM is actually, if I understand, isn't it? It's, it's sort of like a protocol that you could theoretically, and I know companies do, spin up their own NPM mm -hmm. instances. So we don't necessarily have to think of NPM as the one global universal repository. It can be a way to get your, your own company intranet repository or something that's like true. that. So I think that's good. But I would also say uh, Git and GitHub are pretty awesome for that too. So we don't have to discount those as the place that we keep repositories. Uh, go to the audience here. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. But uh, do you have a comment on this? Oh, your name's on your badge, oh. Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, ha we have the issue as well that a lot of these tools are now being stored in GitHub. Uh, GitHub's a company and we're relying a lot on GitHub. So what's, 
what should be done to have a good GitHub? Just distribute it so we can technically use lots of yeah. different. Don't use GitHub. Yeah. yeah. Use Git, not yeah. GitHub. Use yeah. NPM the protocol, not NPM the Registry. universal repo. But what, what about the idea that, um, so I mean, uh, obviously you can spit up your own thing, but NPM is now, it's a private company, right? And if you go to other languages where there's PyPy and there's Gems, those are all actually community efforts with sponsored, as far as I understand, right? So does that, does that change the landscape at all? No? No. All right, um, I'd throw it out there. <laughs> I'm, sure it, I'm sure it does change the landscape. Uh, I would love to hear from Gareth about this. I mean, when you work with government people, what, uh, I would love to hear from Gareth about that. When you work with government people, what do they say when the piece of software that you rely on is a 0.1 release yeah. and not a 102050 um, release that can be trusted? So the version number thing is nearly a red herring because like, it's an arbitrary string, basically. Um, it's, it's only representing value in the eye of the author. And so you can just go, well, if someone goes, oh, well, it's got to be one. Like, if you tell the author, they might just say, make it one. <laughs> um, uh, but there is a, and ultimately, like, different organizations will have different sort of, like, like risk appetites. Um, with, and that's true of, like, so like, I know with the government, yeah, there's going to be banks. There's probably going to be, like, your new startup. The thing that kills your new startup is probably not a, bad dependency from a third party managed service, but it might be something that has an impact on a bank because someone tries to compromise that service and come back to you. Um, it's a really hard problem and it's not specific <coughs> to JavaScript, it's specific to risk, like third party package map services, um, which broadly, like sort of having one per language was a stupid idea, it's too late to fix it. Um, so the next new language that comes around will probably have a, like an NPM or a Ruby gems it's a bit of a shame. Um, the package management systems within operating systems sort of solve a lot of the problems and people forget about the problems they're solving. Um, CPAN for Perl does loads of like really interesting stuff that no one's recreated in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna. Yeah. Um, oh. one, one addition. I think one thing that will help us with at least the security concerns about using NPM is if, when NPM adopts something like Maven does with package signing and, and stuff like this, so we can like assure our, our clients that this, this thing is like really the thing that we uh, said it's gonna be there and not something different because someone hijacked it or so. Well, it, sol it solves the sort of man in the middle issue. But it, it doesn't solve the fact that someone no. might have compromised the person who was uploading it in the first place. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but in but general, isn't it, uh, I find it always fascinating. Guys, sorry, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting thrashed to get to the new topic. Okay. Right, cool. um, so we could go to the audience again. Um, and I think this is a um, pretty exciting question. Oh, I guess I'm not going to the audience. I guess I'm supposed to ask Kyle Simpson to ask a question. <coughs> like I said, they put me on the panel so that I could stir things up. So I get the pleasure of asking this question. There's a mini browser wars going on right now between Grunt and Gulp. And we toyed around with having you all have to stand up and declare where you are on that, but we won't. But there's other several, <laughs> several other would-be contenders. And that sort of betrays this idea that maybe there is one right build tool to rule them all. So the question is, is that a realistic idea that we're striving towards one great build tool that we need to find? Or is it just idealistic? And is it harmful fragmentation or useful experimentation? I think that traditionally having multiple tools is a good thing because it drives innovation. And I don't think that that's a bad thing in this community. Um, build tooling on the front end is still very young and it's, it's <laughs> somewhat in its infancy. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Um, one thing I would like to see is us um, sort of standardizing on perhaps a task specification. Um, I know that uh, there's been some effort from different build tools to uh, standardize on the node task spec, which talks about things like um, having a, a, a single way to handle records or, or uh, logging or, or notifications and so forth. Um, I think that that could actually help us avoid having to sort of have this sort of a crazy wheel of re-implementing things all the time, but um, I know it has its own challenges. I, I have an opinion on the gulp and grunt thing, which is I don't care. Um, I don't use either of them, uh, and I, I see uh, these tools as um, useful um, if for certain situations, but they are kind of glue <laughs> that sticks together interesting things. Um, I think the discussion and browser war type um, arguments going on, well, I'm not sure if anyone's really arguing, but um, arguments going on between these things um, really distract from why we're even doing a build process in the first place. Like, we're doing it to get faster websites, to get better um, development time and so on. 
if you use grunt, if you use make, if you use and, I don't care. Um, it's like what we actually do in the build process, which is actually important. Um, I, I would personally like to see less people re-implementing grunt coffee, uh, gulp coffee, whatever, and just have coffee. <laughs> like, <laughs> just use that and hook so into it So you feel like we should get closer to the grain and just actually like call the existing tools rather than writing like wrappers around this? It seems to I be mean, interesting. Like, the wrappers are fine, but just recognize that they are just wrappers. Um, the important thing is what it's wrapping and what that actually does and how you can plug these things together is just details. There and was a write-up some months ago about, uh, it was kind of tongue-in-cheek, but it was tasks.js, which boiled down to simply just writing the JavaScript yourself. <laughs> and while it was funny and sort of interesting from a boilerplate perspective, I think what it, I think what it does miss a little bit, the reason I write tools and the reason I would make a grunt um, plug-in for my tool is not because that's the only way to use my tool. It's because I'm trying to lower the barrier to entry so that I get bigger market share. I'm trying to make it so there's as little boilerplate as possible to drop my template engine in. Um, of course, some people, and I might have the same perspective, but some people would say, well, it's okay to raise the barrier a little bit. If you want to use it, you have to know how to use it. Call the API, well document the API. So I think that's the reason why plugins exist. Everybody wants to make it so that their tool is the one that blows up and gets 10 million stars on GitHub. Uh, Sebastian, you yeah. had a comment there. I mean, the thing is, with, with all these dependencies, with all these plugins, when we say, okay, we have a common interface, so we ha only have one plugin that works with all of the both systems, perfect. I mean, in the end, it's, it's a tool, and a tool should help us. So if uh, I like Hammer B better in my hand than Hammer A, then I use Hammer B because it's better for me. And the same is it with Grunt and Gulp and Broccoli and Fess or whatever. I mean, um, if you're a node developer, um, Gulp.js feels more familiar with all the stream stuff, and so you can, you can write it because it feels more familiar. And if you're a front-end developer, <coughs> most of them like Grunt more because it's like this declarative approach where you only have to configure things. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes down to use, use the, tool for, the right tool for the job. Okay, can, can I go to the audience here? Because there's like a bunch of hands going up. Um, just first over here, and then um, Remy. Well, my question is actually, actually kind of previous. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so uh, <coughs> disclaimer, unfortunately, I'm one of these people who has also developed another build tool uh, for Obama. Um so I agree with everything we've, we've said, and I think the idea of having inter inter interact between plugins is great. One thing to remember is to, that these tools are there to make it really easy for people. We want people who are scared by the command line to be able to do the right thing by default without having to worry about you know, configuring crazy paths everywhere. Uh, so to me, what the, the real question is, what is the good baseline for <coughs> these tasks that would work in different tools so that it does the right things and just to throw a few examples is, should it be able to produce source maps correctly for everything by default? Mm -hmm. Should it be able to rebuild partially so you don't have to rebuild all your things every time? And all these things, I think, need to feed into what what is the, the, the common sort of format for these build tools? I think one of the, one of the really big challenges with coming up with a, a spec for, for build processes um, and, and that task spec is, is that um, it's difficult to create something that is flexible enough to um, also match the architectures of these different tools so that they can work under, you know, behind the scenes and do what they need to do without necessarily feeling overly constrained. Um, and unfortunately, so the, the node task spec idea that I talked about earlier, that's actually something that is currently on hold because none of the build tools could actually reach agreement on, on how they should approach this problem. Um, it's really, really difficult. I'm hoping that later on in the year they'll, they'll come back to it and think that it's, you know, it's something we, worth value. We, yeah, Sorry, we, uh, we talk about sort of like, oh, it's good to have multiple tools because that breeds innovation. Um, don't think you can't get locked into an open source tool because you can. It's not just commercial. So like we talk about lock-in. You, you get yourself locked in by something by saying, like, you know what, the barrier to moving from this tool is so great, I'm not going to do it. <coughs> At which point you benefit not not one bit from the innovation coming from other tool. Okay, can I get a quick comment from the audience here for, from from Remy <coughs> Sharp? Yes, yeah, I, I mean I don't personally use uh, uh, build tools at the moment. I, there's one step, but the thing is, jQuery is the it was the tool that made working with JavaScript really stupid simple for a, a large amount of people, and suddenly they were able to write JavaScript without writing JavaScript. And these big build tools have given me a way of just adding minification and you know, getting that done, whereas before I wouldn't have done it, and many other people have been doing it. 
you're talking about getting locked in. It, I don't think it matters at this point. The build, like, so, like getting hold of build tools at this point was so, it's so new for this community. Um, if we get locked into Grunt for a few years and eventually every, uh, there's, there's standardization in five years' time, then that's a huge step forward compared to just not doing it at all and just delivering massive images over wire, uncompressed images. We're still at that very, very, I think we're still at that very early days of when jQuery was kind of released for, for JavaScript. I, I agree with that. I feel like this build tool conversation sometimes, like, uh, it, it skips over the fact that we don't talk enough about what's inside our build process. Like, we should be caring more about, like, image optimization and image compression. I mean, that's the thing. Images are the thing that are, like, slowing down the web today. And we need to get more people caring about those problems and spend more time talking about, like, how we can actually speed up our pages and less time, perhaps, on, you know, arguing why you should be using Gulp versus Grunt. I mean, they're still fantastic tools. But um, as I think Sebastian said earlier, um, people who are more familiar with Node are perhaps going to use Gulp, and people who aren't are just going to use Grunt. And that seems to be working. Uh, I'm going to cut you guys off, because actually the next question, I think, uh, goes into just what uh, Addy was, was touching on. Um, I'm looking for, from the audience, um, Peter, Peter Mueller. I will have to read this as well because it's been changed a bit. <laughs> uh, most build scripts, uh, including those uh, generated by scaffolding, are a chain of several discrete steps. Uh, do we even need the complexity of having control of every one of these steps? Or should we instead have an opinionated build chain uh, that just gets us to the endpoint that we're interested in? Um, like this, let's go with Nick and I. Yeah, um, so like, from my experience, like I've, I've built an opinionated tool chain for our own uh, build system that we needed. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy with it. There's been a lot of work put into it, obviously, but I think in the end, you actually get, um, like if, if you really want to get total performance out of uh, your, your build process, not in terms of how fast it runs or anything like that, but in terms of what actually executes at the end of your build process, um, then I think that's, that's definitely a very smart way to go. Um, and you definitely don't need um, any particular um, tools like Grunt or Gulp to, to get you there. Um, Kyle had yeah. a comment on this, Yeah, I was, uh, so I think going back to the Unix philosophy, which is certainly informs a lot of what we're doing, it says have lots of tiny little tools that can be woven together. And I think that's the more appropriate way of doing this. Uh, when you get to the point where you've decided that there is a particular flow through those tools that makes sense for you, you write yourself a bash script so you don't have to repeat it again. And that's all you need. And in the JavaScript world, when you have a set of API calls through these different tools, you just write yourself a little node script that repeats that process over and over. So I don't think we need to worry <coughs> so much about, oh, there's too many details here. You just wrap a script around it, and then you don't have to worry about the details. I think details the thing is, you, you said, for me, and I write. And I think, actually, <coughs> sharing that unit for some people is really valuable. Some people in this room are going to go like, I'm a really good programmer. I, I'm, and that's what, exactly what they're going to do. And, some and like Remy is saying, some people like in this room or not are going to go like, I have no idea what all these steps are doing. So I just but I want the magic from people who are really smart to do it for me. No, so I what, just make a gist, and then I tweet it out. That's my solution So to that one problem. of the things that we, we try to do with... Can you reach the non people? Yeah. Distributing really us usable software is hard. Packaging that up into a sort of something that is just easily usable off the shelf by someone who does not understand what's going on in the middle is hard work. Um, but like, it's valuable. And there's probably two or... Th like Instead of these millions of plugins, there's probably two or three good ways that would be good enough for 80% of the people. Sorry, so one of the things we tried doing with, uh, with Yeoman is um, actually trying to provide people with like opinionated workflows, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to things like performance and, and what we think people should be doing. Because a lot of people don't know exactly what they should be getting um, in their build process to actually keep their pages fast and so forth, or what build tasks they should be using, whether they're using like, grunts or gulp. Um, and so there do, there do exist solutions to, to help you with, with opinionated stacks for this stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, if you find those too, those, those too much and too overbearing, you can always just use them for reference, right? In the same way that people use HTML5 boilerplate. Um, just take what you want, delete key friendly the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, just going to go back to Peter here. Yeah, I'd like to touch on, uh, on Kyle's point about the Unix philosophy. I love the Unix philosophy, small tools being able to, to chain them together. The thing is that Unix pipes work with text, and webs of files are not text. We would need to be able to pass objects like we, we can do in PowerShell. 
Yeah, as well. Because uh, the thing is, uh, some, are, some of the things that are really, really difficult to do with the existing build tools, uh, revving files, uh, concatenating files, uh, all that stuff, are things that both Grunt and Gulp do really badly, actually, because they're based essentially on a continuation of the Unix philosophy or the makefile philosophy. Like I, I, I touched on earlier, like steal things from things outside your community, and one of the things to steal from is PowerShell. Because for those that haven't come, that are familiar with sort of like that Unix philosophy of sort of chaining small things together, PowerShell adds basically a full object in between those things, and you can do a lot more with that. But I don't, I don't think we need that. Uh, if you look at, um, a, a, not that it's bad, but I don't think we necessarily always need that. If you look at the flows for JavaScript tooling parsers, analyzers, transpilers, code generators, and that whole flow and that round trip. If you look at that, they decided <laughs> we start out with source code, and then we move to a tree format. And there's a relatively agreed upon tree format, the AST. We're actually working on a, a more complete version of that called a concrete syntax tree. You, that's the thing that moves from tool to tool. And then what you get out is more compiled code. So I, feel, I, feel like I don't a, think that's a big problem. I feel like we've gotten a little off track. We've, we've, we're, we're, we've moved from, is there merit to having, you know, a like let's say like a, pl a plugin like Grunt Awesome that just does everything and whether now we're getting into the details of chaining and stuff like that. Um, so maybe just to just bring us back, um, just a comment Sorry, over here. Because um, I think a lot of the things we, we, the Unix idea is to chain yeah. things through, sort of in a functional way. You're taking output from one thing into the next thing, but some some of the things we do, um, and there's one in Yeoman that you. you the one that transforms, you can you can um, run things, uh, sort of, so it takes it can take chunks of uh, uh, JavaScript and compile them into different files, and it keeps state, so it can do something at the start, go through the whole chain, and then refer back to something that happened, and that's the same for uh, revision re revving things. You have to have some idea of the state of the whole system to be able to rev things later on and go right. This is what has appeared. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea of just having chains, even in Unix, you do st stupid things where you write, write temp files and you get into all this sort of weird stuff when you're trying to do something that just isn't fundamentally functional. So we always go back to that. I'll just do it the Unix way. But there are some things that just can't be done that way in, in very well. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, uh, yeah, like that's that's kind of what I was saying. Like this this build script that, that we use has a lot of these things that like at the start we find all the assets and then we have that a state that is then used later on. Um, the downside of that is that it, it means that like you can't really share your tools very easily because it, it's very specific and bespoke to your application. Um, and I, I know like one of this, the themes that's kind of coming here is like sharing and helping people get into the community. Yeah. But there's the other side, which is I want to build the best app that I can <laughs> for me. <laughs> Um, which might sound a bit mean, but like that's my job. Um, and <laughs> I'm pretty sure everyone else here has got a job very similar to that as well. Um, and that you shouldn't forget that, that sometimes you do have to just do something that you can't open source. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Gonna stop there. That seems like a, a good closing point. Uh, me, me, me. Um, <laughs> uh, so, gonna call the next question. Um, um, looking to hear from Ian Feather. Most of the pain in build process occurs at dev iteration. Would it make sense to implement things like SAS and CoppaScript as plugins for developers, removing the need for repetitive build processes, or even in the browser itself? So I think he's kind of talking about having extensions which will allow you to iterate without having to run build Mm -hmm. uh, just to jump ahead of this before you comments, this question interested me because I, what I seem to read, uh, read a lot about new tools like Gulpin <coughs> produce is that uh, the speed of building <coughs> is actually becoming really important to people. So what if we can just you know, not have that at all? Um, any comments? I mean, I'm, I'm generally, I think we were all in agreement about like things like SAS and coffee not necessarily belonging in the browser, right? We, we, we agreed on that mm -hmm. earlier. But I think that um, as in terms of your your iteration <coughs> workflow, um, so Gulp is, is commonly used by people because like when you're uh, when you're actually iterating on a project using SAS, um, it's a little bit faster. Whenever you make a change and you want to see that, like, re that refresh in the browser, you don't necessarily um, have as much of a delay as you perhaps see with Grunt. Um, it's not a, a massive difference, but it's important enough to people that that they sometimes consider switching over. 
um, I think that we need to, to look at how we can actually keep our tools lean and fast where possible to, to improve on it, that. It feels like it's a software thing. Yeah, it's it like what, software. What, what you're saying is, well, I have a, a slow build script, and I bet those browser people have got some really good coders and can, uh, who can do exactly the same thing faster. And it's like, well, maybe, or you could find someone else who can re-engineer your build process to be faster. Yeah. Ultimately, some, you're, still, you're doing the same job, you're just doing it in a different place with code. Um, if Node isn't fast enough, write it in C. So there's Sebastian. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the, I think the thing is, we, we're web people. And we used to hit F5 or Control R and refresh, and, and it changes. And um, not like the Java guys who could like grab a coffee while their <laughs> thing is compiling. And um, I think we, we should really embrace that and not build like tools that are watching in the background of file system and then doing something for 10 seconds before we can see the change in the browser. That's not the web and I think that's totally heading in the wrong direction. You have SaaS and stuff, okay, but really um, don't overdo it. Just yeah, I, keep it clean and simple. I, I think uh, one point here is to um, consider like your, your total build separate to your development time. Um, Things like watches can, can be good, um, or like running a, a local server that, that compiles these on the fly um, and can give you a good enough representation of the uh, production build uh, while you're developing. Um, <coughs> if your build script takes less than five minutes, that's fine. Above that, there's a problem, but less than that, I wouldn't care. As long as when you're developing, uh, that, that uh, feedback loop is, is very short, and do that through uh, file watching, serving individual files on the fly. Um, and then if you separate those two ideas, then I, I don't think you hit this problem. One area that I think definitely, just real quick, yeah, one area ahead. that definitely needs to get better with those tools is the incremental recompile. So just because I change one SAS file doesn't mean I really <coughs> actually want to recompile the entire damn directory, but that's often what happens. Mm -hmm. So if we could get smarter tools that it could understand, I only need to change this, recompile this one little part of this one little file, that would certainly speed up a lot of that time. I get a comment here from uh, Jake Archibald. It's right in the middle. People can't decide which mic he's going to get. Uh, aside from a, the, the performance issue, if uh, the browser understands uh, SAS or, or CoffeeScript, do, doesn't that make tooling better? We've got source maps at the moment, but that, that is just a basic mapping. Wouldn't we get a lot more if the browser actually understood the other language? Didn't, didn't you I think that we... <laughs> Uh, when you say the, the browser understanding of the languages, I think we need to, to realize that it's not, it's not just about like SAS and coffee. It's about SAS and less and stylus and other crazy thing that's been created while people are sitting in this room. But it's it, like it, it, we have to define limits about how we can actually go about supporting these things and what we support. Because like if, if the browser were to support that, that goes back to one of the earlier questions about us um, having some sort of like a pre-processed step where the browser could perhaps call out to external tools um, to actually get the job done. Because um, that, that's realistically the only way I can see it being done without you baking in support for SAS like, into, into the browser directly. And it comes back to the, with the build process thing as well. It's still build process. It's just you've split it over like, the browser and your code. That's, that could be fine. Um, and yeah, getting into the browser is probably easier than getting into a standard. But it's not as easy as like, grabbing a plugin or writing some, some code yourself. So I think there's, there's this barrier to entry there. Yeah, it's not quite the standards thing. But still, like grabbing like the Chrome source code and adding that feature and getting it through a process whereby it's fit for everyone else to use, much higher barrier to entry. Someone earlier said, and I, I, I think it bears repeating, uh, as soon as you put something into the browser, now it's going to move a whole lot slower in terms of change. So I don't think we ought to put SAS in there until we're really sure that it's pretty much done. And I don't think it is. So I think we need to keep it separate. Uh, first comment over here from. Uh, a quick one, when you said like uh, ramping up people, um, I think the web started and became so big because it was easy to write something, put it in the browser and see it. And when I see a lot of people tweeting, like that people <coughs> look up to, that tell people if you want to start with web development, go to the command line, get a Ruby gem, do this, do that, do that. Yeah. It's no wonder <coughs> we're losing new developers to close platforms instead of the web. Yeah. So um, could we do a better job in actually, uh, in actually promoting power tools only to power users, rather than saying start with this? Yeah. I think uh, so. Sorry. I, actually, um, we've got one more question coming up that I think basically captures this. Um, so I think we're just going to jump jump to that also because we're running low on time. Um, 
Uh, boy, if I can, should have queued this up ahead of time. Oh boy. Oh, this is ugly. <laughs> um, I swear it was here. Let's start addressing this question <laughs> while you look it up. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, it's more like it's looking finding the person who speaks well, it. Who, who's got that question? Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, let's, let's go to the audience. It's a question about you know does is is tooling taking us away from these fundamental uh, yeah. building blocks? You do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there we go. <laughs> See, crowdsourcing. <laughs> I think that the uh, the fastest iteration loop today is probably just sticking directly with HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Um, only use these power tools when they're actually going to be genuinely useful to you, right? That's I think that that's that's at the core of what you're saying. And I don't think that we should move away from that. If you if you're just hacking away on something, there's no reason not to stick with those tools. Um, where all this other stuff um, becomes important is when you're trying to develop for like a a large system or something that's going to go out to production, um, and you want to make sure that you know if, if someone's accessing something on a slow network on a phone, that it's actually still fast, mm -hmm. right? So I'm um, just gonna sorry, go so ahead. Also, can you say your name because I I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, my name is Flurry, um, and the question. Obviously, it has been rewritten, but um, <laughs> it, uh, it covers uh, my question exactly. Um, as build processes become more and more complex, our source code gets further away from the fundamental building blocks of the web, JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. How does this affect future maintainability, and is this a good thing? Hmm. Yes, it's a good thing, because <laughs> we all pick our, our various levels of abstraction. Some people loved writing in assembly, some people didn't, so we picked a higher level of abstraction. So all of these extra tools and things, when you decide, source, uh, I say this all the time, source code's not for the computer, it's for the developer. The computer just cares about ones and zeros. So you choose ClojureScript because you like something about that tool and the way that allows you to express your code. And that makes you a better and faster and more efficient developer, so that's a good thing. So to, to, to play, to play um, just devil's advocate for a moment, um, but what about all the resources that we put behind HTML and CSS? We have, you know, MDN doesn't have CopyScript examples. Um, and W3Schools does not have uh, SAS <laughs> examples. Um, you know, like, is, is that, you know, like we, we have like this, this huge base of knowledge and are we, you know, getting away from that? And is that necessarily bad? I think back in the days we looked for developers for the web and they must understand HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And today, we're looking for TypeScript developers, SAS developers, and not... Who's looking for TypeScript like, developers? Yeah, I, I said, like, when, <laughs> like, I'm, yeah, certainly when, when we're hiring, we're not. Like, we're looking for... I'm, like, when, on the programming side, we look for programmers. And, and on the front end side, we're looking for people with a really good understanding of HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Like, and the fact is, everything else they'll learn. So like, we, like, we write a lot of Ruby code, and we've hired actually relatively small number of people who were proficient in Ruby to start with, that but they were programmers. Then, then you're doing it. Then, then you're doing it right. But I've seen job descriptions with like lists of tools, and it's like, oh, um, in the end, uh, you don't need to know all, all of them. But we just line them up because they're so popular, and we want to attract people to work for us. <laughs> it's like that's stupid. <laughs> and this is where you get job descriptions like 15 years Angular JS experience. <laughs> 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 I think to we're go, not going to fix that. I think to go to what Christian was saying about like the um, how scary it is for a new developer. I don't think that should <coughs> hold us back. Um, I mean, you can still start with you can still have those tutorials. They're definitely very worthwhile. But um, JavaScript is where it is now because we didn't let it hold us back. That we did start building upon it um, and create really amazing things with it. And the more that people do the amazing <coughs> things, that's even better. So. Um, I don't think necessarily having a, a zero level um, entry barrier is uh, a goal. Uh, just want to get an update from Florian. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think you're not really addressing uh, my question because what I'm worried about is uh, I'm, I'm writing code today and it may, it may be SAS, it uh, may be CopyScript, <coughs> and in five years' time, I go back to that code and I can't run it anymore because it's not standardized. It, um, I, all I can run is my previously compiled code, and I, the output is. Uh, I think that should be a, a serious consideration before you choose one of those tools. So one of the challenges mm -hmm. with choosing uh, different so organizations as well are going to have a different threshold for that. Because if in five years' time your startup's either been sold, at which point you don't care, or it's, <laughs> <laughs> or it's gone bust and you don't care, actually pr probably doing what optimizing for right now is massively important. 
government stuff? Like, yeah, complete. Like, I'm not going to choose something that's not sound bias. Mm, Addy had a comment. I mean, I was I was just going to say that if you're if you're choosing an abstraction, you're almost marrying yourself to it, um, and you can't expect you know if, you can't expect SAS to necessarily be the thing that people are going to use in five or six time, years time from now. You can't expect people to still be using CSS though. Um, and probably JavaScript and probably HTML. So sometimes um, staying closer to the grain is not necessarily a bad idea. But um, to add to, to your point, a lot of the time these days, people are just trying to build stuff that works now. And you need something that's maintainable for, for right now. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if that makes sense, sure, use these new tools to augment your experience and make it easier for you to develop. But I think that our abstractions are something that are, you know, they're not going to be around forever. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're out of time. So I think that's a good, good place to end. Um, just want to thank um, all these amazing panelists for their thoughts and opinions. And thank you guys for being here.